Please welcome in conversation on economic justice, survival sex, and sex work, community organizer Cecilia Gentili, steering committee member of DCRIM New York, Jessica Raven, and government relations manager at Harm Reduction Coalition, Kiefer Patterson. Hi, everybody. So good to see you all again. I am having so much fun. Um, yesterday, I spent a lot of time like walking around and talking to people, and uh, it's so good to just see that you know these soli solutions that you know we are trying to create here apply to the whole country, right? You know, like and I saw people from Oklahoma. Where are my friends from Oklahoma that I met yesterday? They're sleeping late today. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Like, you know, and we were talking about their work in Oklahoma, and I was, like, so happy that, you know, that we're doing this. So thank you all for being here, and uh, I am just so excited to be with these two amazing folks. Thank you all for being here. So we're going to talk about a little bit about economic justice, survival sex, and sex work, and we're going to conversate. This is going to be like we are in my house or in my living room, and we are just talking, and you all get to see it. How does that look? We all have a fantasy to know what happens in other people's living room, right? <laughs> I do. Joy voyeurs. <laughs> so, let's talk about, first about, like, you know, when we talk about survival, sex, and sex work, what do we understand as a difference of those two things? Why, why, why is it a difference, and what is that difference if it is? Sure, I can jump in. So hi, y'all. I'm so excited to be here and so excited to be talking about sex work at a homelessness conference. It's so important. Um, I think the difference between sex work and survival sex, so sex worker was, it, it was coined as a political term in the 1970s by Carol Lee, who was a um, sex workers' rights activist, right? And it was meant to be an umbrella term to include people who trade sex for resources for any reason, um, whether it's you know survival sex or you consider this your form of labor, um, but the term doesn't always fit perfectly, right? And so, so many of us, um, especially those of us who experienced homelessness and were trading sex to access housing, uh, didn't see ourselves as sex workers. And it was just like, this is the secret thing that I do to access what I need. <laughs> um, but I think once you like know the context and know, um, you know, understand what it means to identify as a sex worker and how um, that political identification is connected to policy um, and, and like that actually impacts your life, um, I think that's when the term becomes useful, when, when you were organizing to end criminalization which harms people who are homelessness, or who are experiencing homelessness most severely. Wow, thank you. Yeah, Kiefer? When I, I used to work at an organization called HIPS in Washington, D.C., which is a sex worker outreach program and harm reduction program. Congratulations on your bill. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> DC, DC just introduced a bill to decriminalize sex work in D.C., and I'm just so excited. Yes. Um, yeah, really love my, my hometown org, but... Um, you know, we, they, we used to talk about sex work existing on a spectrum ac across choice, coercion, circumstance, and like survival sex kind of exists to cover that coercion, circumstance part of that spectrum. Increasingly, I've become a little uh, uncomfortable with the term, though, because so often I feel like survival sex work is used to describe uh, a really like racially and class coded kind of type of sex work. Uh, and at the same time, uh, like Jessica was saying, when I was homeless, I was engaging in like very transactional sex. I mean, often literally like for cash and did not understand what I was doing as sex work. And survival sex was a really useful term for me personally in understanding my own kind of trajectory. And I feel like the increasingly like we need to find more nuanced ways to talk about this because um, yeah, there are some limitations to the term. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because it, it, you know um, I you know uh, during all my years like working in the sex trade you know I went from you know different identifications to identifications and um, I really never felt comfortable with um, any terminology to describe uh, you know what I was doing I knew that I was working mm -hmm. and you know and 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 that was it right but uh, I think like it is time for us to look for terminology that is more comprehensive. So the next question is, what are the biggest challenges that uh, youth 
faces when engaging in, um, in this work experience. Um, and, and I know, you know, I can talk about me when I was young, but, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about what happened now with youth. What, what are the challenges that people that engage in, um, in uh, the, the, the sex trade face nowadays? I mean, first and foremost, it has to be criminalization, right? The criminalization of identity also, in terms of who is engaged in sex work as youth. Um, but then also, so often, uh, I know we bonded very early in our friendship over this, is that housing is, is so often the driving factor for young people engaging in sex work, lack of access to housing, lack of access for safe housing. Uh, and when you combine the criminalization of the activities that we're engaged in to survive and the inability for us to access housing, you kind of put us in a place that there's no possible way for us to, to win here. Uh, and then also, I think, through the criminalization of other street market economy uh, activities, uh, the, selling of, the selling of drugs, the using of drugs, just the criminalization of homelessness, criminalization broadly. And then um, to add to that, you know, homelessness is stigmatized and criminaliza or criminalization stigmatizes sex work and so living with the stigma makes it harder to access resources, to access support, to access alternatives. Um, but I think housing is really the top thing, uh, or homelessness is the top challenge facing youth in the sex trade. A lot of youth wouldn't be trading sex if not to access housing, but we have more than 500,000 youth experiencing homelessness in the United States and less than, there are about 4,000 shelter beds for 12 to 17 year olds across the United States. Some cities and states don't even have shelters for 12 can, to 17 can, can year olds. Can you repeat those numbers? Yeah. Like yeah, so at least 500,000 youth between the ages of 12 and 17 who are unaccompanied and experiencing homelessness, as many as 1.6 million, so it's hard to count youth experiencing homelessness for many reasons, partially because many engage in sex work and will, you know, maybe stay at someone's house for a night or a week or a weekend or whatever. Um, and only 4,000 shelter beds dedicated to 12 to 17 year olds, even fewer dedicated to LGBTQ youth who um, we know in New York trade sex at seven to eight times the rate of their cisgender and heterosexual peers. So there are just not enough resources and um, there are a lot of people who wanna rescue youth in the sex trade, which is great and cool. You know, Nobody wants teens to have to trade sex to access housing, but there aren't enough investments in housing and in the resources that youth need. So, so often, um, you know, even in my experience, like I went, one of the first places I went when I was experiencing homelessness in New York was Covenant House. I was there for three days, um, and then they sent me back to a foster home where I experienced sexual assault without ever asking me why I left in the first place. Um, and I think that, you know, we have to think about what it means when we say we want to save youth from the sex trade. Like, where are they going? Are they going to jail? Or are they going back to the street where they're experiencing sexual violence still? Um, are they going back to foster homes where they don't feel safe? Um, we need alternatives. We need safe places for young people to live. That's a, thank you. Yes, yes. Um, um, I think, like you know, it's something that we also should talk about. Like you know, what is the agency of like you know of a of a you know teenager of a young person? Like you know, I always felt like I had enough agency to make decisions in order to survive and do what I had to do as a, you know, as a teenager and as a young person. And it's always like, I think that like we keep perpetuating that idea that, you know, young people don't know what they're doing ever. Like it's a, you, you don't know what you're doing and because you don't know what you're doing, everything that you do that comes from you is wrong. Yeah. One of, one of the phrases that I hear often in the youth homelessness space that drives me up the fucking wall is the, is, uh, developmentally appropriate. I like you. Appropriate. I like, I have a, no, no, no. <laughs> it's developmentally appropriate. We have to offer developmentally appropriate services. I'm sorry. Homelessness isn't developmentally appropriate. When I'm, when I was 13 and homeless, I wasn't at a place where I was going to transition back into being a middle class white kid. That wasn't going to happen, right? Uh, and I was doing what I had to do to survive. And I think any kind of, uh, one of the other barriers that comes with the stigma of, of sex work, I think is the, the, that taking away of agency, exactly as you're saying, and designing programs that infantilize young people who have a tremendous amount of resilience and uh, ingenuity in the way that we're surviving kind of really difficult circumstances and then treating us like, like children when we're living lives that are 
you know, not your traditional developmentally appropriate uh, experiences, I think is uh, one of the ways that our systems fail young people experiencing homelessness engaged in sex work. Yeah, and there's a, ter yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and there's a term for this. I learned it recently. Adultism. You know, we. Oh my God. <laughs> that is, you know, it's a form of oppression. It, we assume that we know better for young people what they need, and um, as adults, we have to learn to listen to young people. So the phrase of the day is gonna be "fuck adultism," <laughs> right? How about that? Um, so, you know, um, it is, uh, you know, uh, another thing. I totally deviate from the questions that we had. Oh, my God. I'm, <laughs> I'm terrible. So, I w <laughs> I, we had questions, I swear. But, you know, that's the idea. It was that what I wanted. I wanted to engage in a conversation where the questions are like, bless you. <laughs> you need a tea or something? <laughs> so, um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, something that you mentioned, Jessica, is that, you know, as, and something that I experience as a young person trading sex, you know, I work with friends, right? And, and uh, I work in, in my friends' houses, right? Um, and, uh, you know, how is that dynamic when that dynamic is criminalized, right? right? Right. Um, I mean, we were as we were working to introduce to the legislation in New York um, that will decriminalize selling and buying sex. We're also looking at all the other ways that um, that people are criminalized for trading sex. And one was a law in the books. What's it called? Something like housing lewd persons. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real law on the books in New York, and we have to repeal it. And it's part of our legislation. Um, but yeah, so we know that you know people who are experiencing homelessness, who are trading sex, are more vulnerable to violence, more vulnerable to exploitation, more vulnerable to trafficking, and also we criminalize housing them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anything to add to that shit? <laughs> <laughs> I just, the, it, 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 that for me plays into this idea that the systems that we design to save youth from sex trafficking have nothing to do with saving young mm -hmm. people, right? We're doing, everything that we can as a society to make it as difficult as possible to survive. Uh, and so it undermines for me the narrative that, uh, that the anti-sex trafficking movement by and large is actually about saving young people from sex trafficking. It's about policing bodies. It's about policing uh, identity and it's about criminalizing vulnerable populations. Yeah. And criminalizing interracial relationships, you know, that's the way that these laws are used most frequently. You see ads um, at airports and hotels, like, if you spot trafficking, call this number, call this hotline, uh, turning everybody into, you know, someone on the lookout for trafficking. And um, just a few months ago, I think it was in February, like, Cindy McCain, who's a big advocate of the anti-trafficking movement, was at an airport and, um, I guess, spotted what she believed to be trafficking and then tweeted about it afterwards and said, you know, I'm so glad that I was able to report this incident of trafficking at this Arizona airport. And literally, even the police ended up coming out with a statement against her and saying, hey, actually, she didn't stop trafficking. There was no trafficking happening in this situation. This was a multiracial family. Um, and so often, these laws, these ads are used um, it, to turn everybody into someone who can better profile and harass multiracial families, people who are in interracial relationships. Um, and, and criminalize that. And that's how the movement started, you know, with the Mann Act in the 1800s that did literally criminalize interracial relationships. Wow. And, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about, like, Cindy McCain. <laughs> Do we have to? <laughs> um, the shoes. She always had awesome shoes. Um, uh, let's, uh, you know, let's talk about, like, you know, how, how this situation made Cindy feel, right? Because I think that's the problem, that everybody wants to elevate themselves as a savior, yeah. right? And it, it's like, it's everybody have that, the need to kind of like rise above everybody else and show themselves as the savior. And like this conversation offers exactly that, right? 
and it's uh, she was uncomfortable, right? And so it's about taking the, coming from a place of I'm uncomfortable by something I see, this interracial kind of uh, family, and I'm gonna I don't want to deal with the fact that that makes me uncomfortable. So I'm gonna switch this narrative so I can be that savior. We see that all the time in in DC where. Uh, so often, uh, the reports of, of sex, traf or sex trafficking or sex work, all the calls that the police were getting were not about like a, even folks engaged in sex work. It was just anywhere trans people were. Anywhere trans people congregated in D.C. was suddenly a place where sex work was happening. That's true in some parts of D.C., but often it's just people hanging out, and that's what prompts you know, the nimbyism responses. So it's often just also just about the discomfort that people have with people who are different from them. Yeah, exactly. And so you see this like, it, 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 there's like this contradiction where um, everybody wants to be a white savior and also um, white folks in gentrifying neighborhoods don't want to live near black and brown people. <laughs> So, uh, right, like, um, we have so many people who are calling the police on their sex working neighbors and also saying they want to fight sex trafficking. And it's like, who, you know, who do you think is most likely to experience trafficking? It's people experiencing homelessness, who exper people who are being criminalized and even trapped in the sex trade, people who want to leave the sex trade. Um, are trapped in the sex trade by criminal records, by um, police harassment and police violence. And often when, when white folks, white saviors, um, call the police on their sex working neighbors, they're making it worse. They're making people more vulnerable. I, yeah, thank you. I, I did this um, TV interview for Headline News, and it was a total setup. It was, I, I was a fool that I said, yes, I should have known better. You know, because this woman already, she had already like an idea of like, you know, sex work, bad. Sex work is a bad thing, and I just went there and I start with this like white savior who says like, I send people to Rikers all the time and I'm happy for it. And I'm like, oh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, and th this woman says like, my aunt lives in the Upper West Side and you know, and she has to report the house next door because it was all these men coming in and out. And I'm like, what was the crime there? What was the reporting? Thank God your aunt don't live next to a hospital. She will go crazy with the traffic, <laughs> right? And also, to be clear, there were men coming and going in my place long after I stopped doing sex work. <laughs> Just let me live my best life. <laughs> I, I have a lot of traffic for free, too. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is non-judging space, so we are not going to judge me, okay? So what are the most common misconceptions about uh, this topic um, between like, government officials and the general public? What, is, what do agencies, what do government officials, what do people in general get wrong about sex work? All of it, <laughs> often. Um, I mean, I, I will say one way that I've, I've seen this play out in the context of homelessness and youth homelessness is that um, the folks who are engaged in sex work are seen as just sex workers, and and this is what happened in D.C. You know, when I was working at HIPS, I was a I was a case manager who was you know, I was employed to do sexual health risk reduction counseling, which none of my clients wanted to talk about. Everyone was fucking homeless. That's what they wanted to talk about. But HIPS wasn't plugged into the homelessness system. And when we got plugged in and I got access to HMIS, I ran my 240 homeless clients through HMIS and only 20 had ever touched that system because even though DC has such a comprehensive homelessness outreach program, really amazing providers, they'd roll through the strolls and just see a bunch of hookers and not talk to any of our clients, uh, even though almost all of my folks were experiencing chronic homelessness. And so one of the things that I think folks get wrong is, is viewing sex workers solely through that lens, right, and missing a whole range of, of needs and uh, lived experiences uh, and ultimately failing a pretty vulnerable set of folks as a result. Yeah. Um, I, 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 as a young person, when I, you know, engaging in sex work, uh, you know, um, at the time, um, you know, I always said, I, I guess I found a way to empower myself by saying, like, I choose this. This is my choice. 
But in reality, you know, how much of a choice it was when it was the only choice, right? It's, you know, a choice at least you need two things to choose. Uh, but I didn't have, like, you know, it was no way for me to find other ways to make my living. And sex work became, like, you know, the, the, uh, the only thing that I, that I was able to do. And it also came from, a, like, you know, uh, this um, uh, empowering moment when I realized that mostly all these men mostly, you know, were fetishizing me and my body, and I needed to eat. So you are gonna fuck me, I need to eat, let's meet in the middle, <laughs> and sex work became, like, you know, what I did for a living. Yeah, yeah, I, I had a very similar experience to that. Just, I, I had experienced sexual assault multiple times, both in the foster system and on the street, and so then sex work became like, Sometimes it was like this way to empower myself to take that control to say, you know, I decide uh, who has access to my body when and for how much. And also, separately, it would be like, well, what else would I do though? <laughs> um, so it would go back and forth. But um, to come back to the questions, question about misconceptions, I think the one of the biggest ones, which we kind of already covered, but um, I think it you know, deserves to be hammered home, is just the, the idea that all young people are trafficked. Um, all young people, all, everyone under the age of 18 is a trafficking victim, and I think that's complicated. You know, under the, By law, um, because of federal laws, all young people are defined as child sex trafficking victims if they're under the age of 18, but data shows that 85% of youth in the sex trade don't have a trafficker. So what do you do with that when the only strategy to end trafficking is criminalize the trafficker and 85% of youth don't have a trafficker um, and don't identify as trafficking victims? And um, it wasn't until later that some states started passing laws, safe harbor laws, to protect youth in the sex trade from criminalization. And only 14 states in the District of Columbia have done that. 36 states still won't pass safe harbor laws because they recognize this complicated reality that most youth don't have a trafficker. And so they're working alone. And a lot of times police officers also see that, well, you know, this person wasn't a trafficking victim because they were working alone. And so they end up in jail anyway. And so the way that laws are designed and the way that... Um, you know, we're collecting data about trafficking, or some some organizations are collecting data about trafficking, is just not helpful. It hasn't been helpful. And then also this idea that uh, a minor that engage in sex work, they're trafficking themselves. It's like, yes. I just cannot understand. Like, you can be charged not only for doing sex work, but for trafficking your own self. And I just go like, you Dude, you just want to send me to jail, right? Yeah. That's, that's all you care for, right? Some of the most Orwellian doublespeak I've ever heard has come from the anti-trafficking movement and describing young people who engage in survival sex with no trafficker as self-trafficked. That's just fucking absurd. So what do we do? How do we best support uh, youth who, you know, uh, engage in survival sex work or sex work, or uh, they are engaged in the in the, um, in the sex trade with the sex trades. Um, when we have all this criminalization in place, what what is the best way to support a young person who engages in 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 sex work? Um, well, I think I'd apply to this advice to like really anyone. I did a lot of work with survivors of sexual violence and also just young people in general, young people in the sex trade. You listen to them. You listen to them and you believe them when they tell you what they need. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, nothing to add. Advocate, advocate for decrim also, I think, get involved in, in decriminalization advocacy. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, this young trans girl, uh, you know, died in uh, Rikers Island. And, like, the road that took her to Rikers Island was an arrest for um, trading sex. You know, she was set up by an undercover police uh, who um, offered her $200 for sex. And when she allegedly consented to it, she was arrested. And then she was sent to trafficking courts when she was not a victim of trafficking. And of course she didn't complete the trafficking court because she was not a victim of trafficking. And because she didn't complete it, it was a bench warrant for her 
when something else happened, the bench warrant pop up, and she ends up in Rikers. With a seizure disorder, she's put in solitary confinement, and they find her dead there. That was Lily in Polanco. She was 27. Can I just add to, in the context now of, of an overdose crisis where we're losing 77,000 people a year to, to fatal overdose death, we also have to acknowledge kind of this intersection of, of substance youth, homelessness, homelessness and sex work. And so it, it, it's not enough for us to uh, you know, view trafficking victims as, as, as victims that need saving and protection if we also are then gonna criminalize the meth use that they were engaged in to stay awake to work all night. Uh, and so uh, broadly working to decriminalize survival behaviors and being able to work with folks who are uh, doing what they need, need to do to get by. Uh, and so you know, trying to break away from there being like the good happy hooker and the junkie hooker, like you have to take care of everybody. I, you know, um, that was, um, and, and, you know, when I talk about Leilin, I get very emotional because that was my, uh, my experience 10 years ago, you know. Uh, Leilin was first set up as a sex worker, right? Uh, the, the undercover offered her money for sex. She said yes. He didn't disclose that he was an undercover. And then he says, like, I'm not just going to get you for sex work. He said, do you have drugs that we can consume? And she said, yes. So then he got her for prostitution and for um, having uh, a controlled substance with her. And that sucks. It's just, why is it a need of a police officer out there setting up people that are not bothering anybody? Is, is, it, is it a real need for that guy to be setting up people around there? Ay, ay, ay. So, can you talk a little bit about the state of employment inequity and inaccessibility in the LGBTQ youth communities? Um, what can you tell me about it? Yeah, um, well, there aren't a lot of uh, job opportunities for young people in general, um, but then also um, trans and non-binary people, especially people of color, experience higher rates of employment discrimination or shut out of um, the traditional workforce a lot of the time and then turn to sex work to survive and then are criminalized for what they do to survive. Um, and so I think that's another layer, another important layer of the work that we have to do. So in DC, we had a really cool program. Um, we were, so I used to be the executive director of an organization called Collective Action for Safe Spaces, and we started a Safe Bar Collective program. And, um, and so we were training bars and restaurants in strategies to recognize and respond to harassment, to use bystander intervention to intervene. And, um, and then I was separately working with my colleague, Nona Connor, who is a black trans, former sex worker, and a survivor. Um, and she was starting to build out a program to support black trans folks in the sex trade. And so then we recognized, we started to collect demographic data in the trainings that we were doing with bars and restaurants. And we recognized that, um, well, first of all, the lo a lot of the folks that we were training were primarily white. There were a lot of people working, um, white folks working in the front of the house of bars and restaurants. And um, there was data that came out in the, from the DC Office of Human Rights in 2017 that showed that 48% uh, of DC employers preferred a less qualified cisgender applicant over a more qualified transgender applicant. Um, and the restaurant industry had the highest number of discriminatory responses. So we saw a problem, we also saw an opportunity. We had a lot of, we had about 30 bars and restaurants that were participating in our program. And um, so we started to partner with the Restaurant Opportunity Center, which already offered a training program, a restaurant job skills training program for folks um, to move from lower paid back of house positions to higher paid front of house positions. And um, we worked with Rock to create a class specifically for black trans folks. Um, and we paid folks for their participation in the class because we recognize that, you know, folks can't just take a class when they're like 
they need housing, they need food, they need to live to get to and from class. So we um, provided stipends for participation and then we connected folks in our program with opportunities in our partner bars. So um, folks were starting to work in our partner bars. Um, and also, separately, we're doing canvassing for decrim because just because it, this was at the time, really at the height of like FOSTA and SESTA, which were two pieces of national legislation that shut down a lot of websites that sex workers used to um, advertise online or used. Um, and so folks were hurting. Folks needed alternative forms of employment or additional income so folks could do sex work, work in bars, and also be working on advocacy and be paid to do advocacy. So often we don't pay people with lived experience to be the advocates, but they have the most information and deserve to be paid for that work. Um, and so, so yeah, so I think there are a lot of innovative programs like that and, and strategies that people are using to disrupt employment discrimination, but it's still you know, a much bigger problem than, than small programs can handle. Um, thank you. I am, you know, um, as uh, somebody that worked in a, you know, nonprofit um, uh, sector for many years, um, uh, I remember, you know, in a couple of my jobs, I had to have, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to hire people in my team, which most most of them were like young trans people because that's everything that I want to hire, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, it it was, you know, it was. A great opportunity for me to sit down with them and like, you know, say like, you know, this person say to me, you know, I did sex work for so many years. All of a sudden, you need me to be here for eight hours and you pay me $15 an hour. I want you to understand that what you're doing for me, I appreciate, but it's not enough. So then I said, what can I do for you? And you know, this person clearly told me, you know, I need you to help me accommodate clients that I need to do in the middle of the day. And I'm like, just let's do it. Let me know, you know, when you need to go home and do your clients. So, you know, because I am not giving you what you need in order to survive in a city where a fucking cupcake costs $6. <laughs> you know? So, what can, and, and then that's what I was able to do for this person, and I'm fucking proud of that, dog. Yeah. <laughs> so many of these nonprofit jobs are, are designed for white folks who are already um, able to live without, you know, like, or, or, or able to take lower paying work or able to do that. Um, not everybody's able to do that. Not everybody's able to work for free or for very low pay. Um, and we have to be able to accommodate folks if we want to make our organizations inclusive or to center and uplift the people who have lived experience. Um, we have to design the jobs for them. And the second, this, that was the second thing that I was able to, to do in this nonprofit, which is a really hard, I had a hard time getting this. So they were, you know, I said like, we need to promote this person right away, as soon as possible. Well, this person don't have a master. And I'm like, she's a young trans black woman. You're not gonna find many black trans women at age 20 with a master. Of course they are because they're brilliant, but you know, many of us don't have those opportunities. So we need to change the job requirements and like, it took me going to management to get that done. Yeah. You know, I hate when it's like, oh, we're trying to hire trans people. Um, but you're asking for a master's. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that you're not going to find many trans people with a master? And, and I'm not saying that they're not out there as many people that were able to shine, you know, and have an education. But the majority of us are not able to get those levels of education. Yeah. And and part of it is also like valuing a different kind of expertise, you know, like not just valuing the masters, uh, understanding that we can't solve the problem without the most information, without the people who have the most information about what the problem looks like, feels like, how it impacts them. Um, that's who needs to be designing the programs, that's who needs to be in leadership. Yeah, and then even, even when we're talking about hiring folks with this kind of lived experience for jobs unrelated to their lived experience, right? 
people who are, who trade sex are are entrepreneurs. They're small business owners. People who sell drugs are managers, sometimes regional managers, right? So if you're asking me to go from running a small crew, at, at, you know, selling meth and coke for 60 grand a year to take a fucking job at McDonald's because my experience can't be on my resume, fuck you. I'm not going to take that job. I'm not. So acknowledging that the people that we're working with who have this lived experience, who've survived a very hostile society, uh, are often probably going to be better managers than your, your kid out of college with a master's and no fucking work experience. That's what I'm... <laughs> yes. Um, I remember when I had my first resume, I made my first resume. I, I, you know, this amazing person helped me do this resume. And I said, like... You know, I was just coming out of from treatment in the in, in a substance abuse facility, and uh, and I said, "What what am I gonna put in my resume?" And this person says, "Like, what what did you do before?" And I said, "Well, I'm just coming out of a you know facility, and I'm just uh, I've been a sex worker." So this person said, "Like, well, you've been entertaining people for a long time." <laughs> And you've been managing yourself for a long time. So you are a manager of entertainment. <laughs> and that's what we put. 20 years of experience. Absolutely. And I got the fucking job. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I remember the first thing that they did, they asked me to put all my clients in a, an Excel sheet because I put that I knew how to do Excel sheets. Lies. I had <laughs> no idea what an Excel sheet was. So my boss, my boss says, like, you know, the first thing he's like, you know, put all the names of your clients in this Excel sheet and just send it to me. And I was like, oh, my God, what the fuck is an Excel sheet? So I went to somebody working there, and I'm like, they're asking me for an Excel sheet, and I don't know what it is. And this person was really nice. He said, Sit with me, I'll teach you how to do it. So, you know, she taught me how, what an exercise she was and she helped me put it. And then I'm like, and how do I add this to a, an email? And I said, it's this thing called attachment. You can attach things. I'm like, cool, thank you. And I sent that email to my boss and I said, you know, this is the sheet that you asked me for. The thing is that in Spanish, sheet sounds S-H-I-T. <laughs> so my first email to my boss said, this is the shit that you asked me for. <laughs> Long two hours meeting about like, how we communicate with each other in this agency. <laughs> Kiefer, Jessica, I am just so happy to be spending time with, uh, with both of you here. And um, give all these folks here resources. Where, where do they find stuff about uh, sex work, about decriminalization? How do they can uh, enlighten themselves with more information? Yeah, so um, you can go to decrimny.org for the New York campaign, and in D.C. it's decrimnow.org, um, and the Twitter handles are decrimny and at decrimnowdc. Thank you. So, you know, uh, please go to those websites and find out about, like, all the movement around decriminalization and support it in any kind of way. And ask questions. You know, it's okay not to know. It's okay to be in, have doubts about decriminalization because we are here to answer those questions and to, you know, help you understand why decriminalization is important. Yeah, tweet your questions. I'll tweet back at you. Yes, yes. Thank you all for being here. And please... Give a round of applause to Keith and, uh, and Jessica Raven. Thank you for being here. <laughs>